good Friday morning to everybody. Um, my name is Jarmo Oikren and I'm the head of the European Parliament Liaison Office here in Helsinki. And I have the pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to this uh, webinar on, on the European Union strategy towards Russia. This is now the third time that we have a high level webinar organized jointly by the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, the Trans-European Policy Studies Association, TEPSA, and our office. Um, and we are very happy to do it once again. In this context, I would like to extend my thanks already to uh, Paul Schmidt, who joins us on behalf of, of TEPSA. He is also the Secretary General of the Austrian Association for European Politics. And obviously, Juha Jokela, who is the Europe Director, uh, the direct, uh, director of the Europe Programme at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, and also will moderate this discussion. Uh, we obviously welcome um, the, our distinguished guest speakers. Uh, I will leave it to Juha to uh, introduce them in, in more in depth. But without further ado, um, I pass the floor to, to uh, Paul Schmidt for open remarks so we can kick off this seminar. Paul, please, the floor is yours. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Jarmo. I'm really happy to be here. Good morning um, from uh, Vienna to Kiev, Helsinki, Brussels and all the other places. And good morning to all the participants and to the audience who's uh, listening to us. Um, Russia and the future of Europe lessons learned and future prospects is uh, the title and the topic of uh, today's discussion and to kick it off I would like to mention this book here I wonder if you can see it uh, it's a, a book which is published in the framework of TEPSA uh, it's a book on Russia and the future of Europe views from the capitals it's a book uh, that goes beyond the European Union because it consists of a collection basically of uh, 41 articles of 41 chapters from 41 different European countries. So we have one analyst for every uh, of these uh, 41 countries that look at the issue uh, through their national lenses. So if you want to know um, about about uh, the Icelandic relations to Russia. Um, you, you look at the uh, chapter on, on Iceland, or if you want to look about what Croatia thinks and how the um, economic, social, historical developments be between Croatia and Russia are developing, well, you look at the chapter on, on Croatia. So it's a collection of similarities, but also of uh, differences between the countries and the book is actually was actually uh, written before or prior to the 24th of February and I think that's that is important to know it gives you a very good uh, basis of um, the, the different uh, the different relationships the different uh, national relationships with Russia um, the complexity of reaching a uh, consensus at European level, uh, um, the complexity of maintaining unity, uh, um, which is an issue where we're doing, I think, um, very well. In fact, um, it actually the book actually takes the reader on the journey, as I say, through the highly interesting and very diverse European uh, political landscape, and it gives you an idea and a flavor. Mm, how different the these relationships were depending on history geography uh, in particular on economic ties but also depending on politics um, all play a role in this in these relationships and if you want to talk about if you want to talk about the lessons learned in the future perspectives it's good to have an idea of um, how the situation on the ground in the different uh, um, countries european countries actually look like uh, because uh, Public opinion is really important here because we want to maintain the support for the political action that was taken. And that's why we have to be very careful and very, um, very ambitious, I would say, and strong in explaining uh, the actions which are taken. 
Um, but also what you can see in the book actually is um, you can get a feeling about the uh, different levels of dependencies that were built up uh, between the countries, the different countries and Russia. Um, you can get an idea of the illusions of special relationships between some of the countries and Russia. You can get a flavor of the impact of narratives and disinformation, uh, which uh, we need to fight uh, at this point in time more than ever. And uh, all these are the ingredients and elements which you need in order uh, to be able to get into the public discussion uh, and, and foster public support. And in fact, um, these public discussions have different levels and different qualities. We have a European discussion, but we have uh, many, many national discussions. They overlap, but the national discussions and the regional discussions have their very characteristics, uh, which we need to know uh, when we communicate on these issues. Now, um, we need to maintain that um, that public support uh, for, for the political direction which we're taking, in particular uh, with the price hike which uh, we all experience. We need to explain where that comes from and how we actually fight it in order to make uh, sanctions work and to actually give our action enough time to uh, develop um, effects and, and their leverage and make a difference. Now, uh, to round this up and start the discussion, I would like to thank very much um, uh, Heidi and, and, and Juha, Kitos, because uh, the two of you, in fact, uh, contributed very much to this book. There's a strong uh, Finnish input in this book. Uh, Juha wrote the chapter on um, Finland and Russian relations, on Finnish and Russian relations, and Heidi was so kind uh, to write the foreword on this book. Um, and having said this, this I conclude, and I very much look forward to the discussion, to the different point of views, and let's get it started. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul Smith, very much for these uh, opening words and, and your views and introdu introductions also about the project that we've been working on. And I fully agree, it's a very important one to bring in these national views on, on important uh, European policy questions, and of course, Russia, uh, EU's Russia policy has been one of those. Uh, thank you also for Jarmo Oikarinen for your for your welcoming words. And I have to say that this collaboration with the European Parliament Helsinki Office, as well as uh, TEPSA, has been very valuable for us, and we see uh, a great value for this to to move on in the future as well, uh, bringing in both the kind of the Finnish audiences, but also more broadly the European audiences to discuss for instance, now Russia relations, uh, as this European dimension is, is more important than ever also for our national discussions. Uh, we will now move on with the program and uh, the webinar, and I will shortly introduce you to, uh, uh, to our guest, our excellent uh, lineup of speakers and invite them also to give their first remarks uh, on the lessons learned and future prospects of EU-Russia uh, relations. And after this first round of interventions, we will move to discussion part of this webinar. Uh, and the audience uh, uh, of this webinar can post their questions and comments by using the chat box of this team's uh, platform. And I will do my best to collect uh, most of those and all of those. I, I, I hope that there will be plenty and present those in a more or less structured way for our, our, our speakers as well. But let's start with Heidi Hautala, uh, uh, who has a long experience in, 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 in politics in general, both on the national and EU level. I think you became a uh, member of the European Parliament already in 1995 when Finland joined the European Union, and you have held several important positions in the European Parliament but also nationally, you have been also a Minister for International Development here in Finland. And currently you are the one of the Vice Presidents of the European Parliament. And within all that uh, uh, career path or uh, politician path, you've been one of the uh, discussions of, of Russia questions, both here in Finland and at European level. 
and you have followed very very closely the EU Russia relations. So I think it would be very interesting to hear your uh, assessment from European, from the EU's uh, point of view, uh, about the lessons learned as well as the future uh, prospects for EU Russia uh, relations. Uh, I think it's difficult now to see that what kind of relations with Russia are possible in in the short term or even the mid term. But perhaps you have some uh, 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 thinking and insights on those kind of uh, questions already done with your colleagues in the European Parliament and uh, and the Green Group. So Heidi, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Juha. Thank you, Paul. And I also want to uh, show you the book because it's it's really a, a rich catalogue to uh, 41 uh, uh, relations with Russia. And of course, this diversity is um, is an emanation of uh, political democratic uh, politi uh, traditions and cultures, but it does pose a challenge. And um, as I was um, uh, asked to, to write the foreword to this book, I actually dwelled quite a long time on thinking what could be said. And I had uh, long discussions with my team, which were very enriching. Uh, and now, of course, uh, the book has been uh, written, and even my foreword has been written before the 24th of February. Then um, I was a bit hesitating to, to read again after the 24th of February what I had written. So I made a kind of a running test. And um, I think um, it's not something that I should uh, be ashamed of, because the, let's say that the, uh, the warnings uh, of what was to come have been around for those who have had uh, the channels uh, to, to observe them. And um, I don't think that I had anything uh, more uh, more uh, special in, in my relationship with Russians, but I was um, uh, for many, many years already listening to, to the civil society, to human rights defenders, to opposition politicians, who gave a very different perspective. And um, so indeed the warnings were there. And I would like to, to quote a bit freely though, uh, some um, important um, experienced um, civil society figures from Russia who wrote soon after the 24th of February this year that a state that uh, kills and suppresses its civil, civic space uh, is then free to attack another country. So I would say that what we had seen at least from 2012 when Putin entered his uh, third term as president We've had a, have had a sort of a very systematic uh, uh, suppression of, of the civic and closure of the civic space, which is now, I would say, complete. So that was a part of the strategy, and perhaps not all of us understood that. So uh, how I would like to see uh, what is now unfolding in, in front of our eyes uh, as a fully-fledged war and aggression of, um, of Russia to a neighboring country totally unprovoked, um, leaving such a huge destruction uh, after it, uh, is that uh, perhaps, um, and this is maybe just a question, is this the last act of the dissolution and end of the Soviet Union? It might be, because if we look to Central Asia, for instance, we see that now, uh, more than ever, some um, Central Asian countries represented by their uh, presidents are teaching lessons to, to Putin and taking distance to him. There, there could be anecdotes. You, you are certainly aware of those, so I don't go through them. But uh, there is this, um, this feeling that, um, for instance, quoting uh, the president of, of Kazakhstan, uh, Tokayev, he said very early after the, 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 the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine that uh, Kazakhstan is not going to end up on the wrong side of the new um, uh, an iron, iron curtain. So he used those words. And I think it's quite a bold and brave uh, expression from a country that has been uh, under a lot of um, dom domination by, by Russia. So uh, how this all will unfold is, of course, uh, still a question, including what, what uh, you have said, Juha, that we don't see yet how and when this, this brutal war will end. But um, there will be, uh, I think, huge uh, geopolitical uh, consequences. Uh, so uh, then, of course, we can look even, even beyond 
Central Asia and, and the eastern neighborhood of, of the EU, which is now even closer to the EU than before, uh, to the extent that um, Ukraine has now been allowed to become a candidate country, and so has Moldova, who are struggling under the pressure, under aggression of, of Russia. And there may be some questions about where Georgia is going, but it's also there somewhere. But then uh, China, uh, it's, uh, Russia, China relations, uh, I think this is uh, something that we still don't know how it will develop. But we see already that, uh, that China is at least uh, giving a passive support, if not more, to, to Russia. Though uh, lately we have seen that it is, it is a bit uh, more ambiguous in its, in its support. We see India, uh, which is also on the fence. Uh, and then we come to the EU. Uh, and I would say that uh, one of the biggest challenges at the moment uh, is that, <clears throat> that the, the Russian narrative is quite widespread. And for instance, Commissioner Jutta Urpilainen, who is responsible for the Commission's inter international partnerships and development cooperation, has, has spoken about this and uh, that uh, we have no reason uh, to be complacent. Uh, we, have to, we have to explain uh, the EU point of view, the European view, the Ukrainian view to the situation. Uh, but at the same time, we must uh, open up and understand the, the huge challenges that, uh, that the Global South is facing in the situation, even if it is not the EU sanctions and Western sanctions. But there is a belief that that is what is behind it. So these narratives, I think we have to we have to be much uh, more aware of, of uh, the limited European Union leverage there and to be to do better. Then, um, then I would uh, like to speak a little bit about um, how uh, I, I would say since September, October, we have uh, seen that there's more and more interventions in the public uh, debate and uh, among politicians, researchers about, let's say, what comes after Putin. And there, again, we don't know what will happen. Is it going for the worse in terms of more authoritarianism, more suppression, more aggression, or could it open a way for something which we could uh, call democratic Russia? Um, I actually, I, ha I had a very surprising experience. I went to Berlin because I had decided to go to, to a concert of Zemfira, who is uh, one of the most famous rock stars in the uh, in, in Russia, now also exiled to, to Paris. And uh, the only person who spoke uh, German among those thousands of people who had gathered in Berlin for her concert was the, the, the man who was selling Bratwurst. So I heard so much Russian. I have, could some of it be Ukrainian because my Russian is extremely primitive. But uh, I saw what I think could be kind of a time leap into a democratic Russia. People who were just like us, any of us, and uh, who, who, you know, I would call them Russian Europeans. And now we have, of course, some new exile communities also from Russia after the war. They are not only deserters, but they are independent journalists. They are human rights defenders. And I think it's our task to support these people as much as we can. can. And I can see that, for instance, Lithuania, Lithuania and Latvia are doing a very good work here with them. And we should continue to do that. Uh, I actually regret that Finland is all, all, almost like a pathway to Europe for these people, because we are not a part of the Russian, Russian let's say, Ruski Me. We never were a part of that. So we are a little bit alien to, in terms of language and culture, but I think we should also try to give give protection to some of these people. And finally, I'd like to say that uh, when I, I read the latest interview of Mikhail Khodorkovsky, he, he's published a new book. Uh, just like Alexei Navalny, he's also speaking about uh, the only chance of a democratic Russia would be to limit the presidential powers. We are speaking about the need to change the constitution to, to a parliamentary democracy. And of course, this is very, very, very far today, but uh, we should support those forces who are working for that, some of them inside Russia and some outside Russia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi Hautala, for this uh, uh, analysis, actually, and, and, and also views on, on Russia. Uh, I think it was uh, excellent that you also brought the broader uh, global context, which is, of course, very significant for 
for for for EU and EU's uh, relations uh, with Russia as well in the future because the strategic competition you mentioned also China and China Russia relations is of course something which will provide a kind of a framework for for EU EU's external race relations uh, in years and decades uh, to come I would think and also this very important question about the development in Russia and I think it's 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 true that no one really knows what happens and I think when one looks at what has happened, it seems that many of those, uh, uh, let's say, people who favor a liberal democratic Russia are now outside of Russia. And that's, of course, creates also an interesting or very important observation that what are the, the potential development trends then within Russia. But of course, there is a lot of uncertainty uh, on that. But thank you very much. And we would now turn to our our a special guest from Ukraine. So we have Oleksiy Melnik with us here today. First of all, thank you very much for being with us during these very difficult and dreadful times in Ukraine. I'm, I'm sure that the thoughts are of the participants of this webinar and your fellow speakers are all with you. And we are happy that, uh, uh, that you also have a uh, workable internet connection and, and you can be with us here. So that's excellent, excellent uh, in many ways. But you are the co-director of the uh, Foreign Relations and International Security Programs in the Rasumkov Center in Kiev. And uh, Rasumkov Center is one of the member institutes of TEPSA, a very active one, have been for several years. And you have also an extensive career uh, in the field of defense and international security. And you have served, for instance, uh, as the first assistant to the Minister of Defense of Ukraine uh, in 2015 and uh, 16. And it would be very interesting to hear your views on the development, of course, in Ukraine. This is something, of course, that we all 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 keep uh, following very closely. And understandably, much of the media attention uh, on Ukraine. Uh, is on the currently unfolding military uh, developments. Yet I hope that we could gain also some views on the political situation in Ukraine, as well as importantly on what in your views are the lessons learned and how the future prospects for peace and stability, one could say in Ukraine and also more broadly in Europe uh, looks like when now looked from Kiev. Please, please, Alexei, the floor is now yours. <clears throat> uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair, for uh, the introduction, for the good, good words. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, taking this opportunity, I'd like to thank everyone who is present in, in this virtual room for immense support provided for Ukraine. And uh, this is something I think that we can hardly overestimate because uh, this is our common battle and I think this is our common task to win this battle. Uh, I would I would like to share some of the lessons learned. Probably I'm not going to waste your time uh, like describing uh, details. Uh, unfortunately, very unfortunately for Ukraine that Ukraine now in the headlines and it's not uh, the case that I would like my country to be present in the world media. <laughs> but anyway, we have what we have. Uh, the ongoing war uh, is a battle for Ukraine's existence in the present day and about its future. This is also our common European struggle for a prosperous, secure, and free Europe. Uh, Sorry for uh, repeating some like obvious things, but uh, I think that we have to repeat from time to time something that is obvious for many of us, but not for everyone, especially when we hear some kind of strong statements or suggestions, suggestions pushing Ukraine towards uh, peace talks uh, on no matter what uh, the condition is, so we have to remind people what the problem, the real problem is, what the scale of our problem is. And uh, I think this is one of the objects of uh, 
for today's event. Um, most of you probably remember uh, the statement from the 2003 European Security Strategy. I quote, Europe has never been so prosperous, so secure, nor so free. The violence of the first half of the 20th century has given way to a period of peace and stability unprecedented in European history. End of quote. It was December 2003. And I assume that <clears throat> not all of you can recall uh, an incident that had happened in Europe just a few months before that optimistic declaration was made public. In autumn 2003, Russia and Ukraine were a few steps away from an armed conflict caused by territorial dispute over Tuzla, which is a tiny Ukrainian island in a Kerch state. There was an attempt of a hybrid annexation by constructing a dam connecting the Russian coast with the Ukrainian island, done by the Russian paramilitary workers with display of military presence, at that time, Ukraine showed its readiness, its readiness to use force, and Russia was not ready or strong enough to escalate at, at that time yet. It was well before Vladimir Putin's 2007 Munich speech, 2008 Georgian war, and 10 years before Russia's annexation of Crimea, and Tuzla Island as well. <clears throat> Uh, this is one one of the lessons, uh, or just remark to the lessons learned. I'm, I'm going to <clears throat> share with you later. So the 2003 Tuzla crisis was not the first dangerous case in Russia-Ukraine relations. In fact, quite a number of them, like challenging the status of Crimea and of the city of Sevastopol, took place during Boris Yeltsin's presidency and well before the world learned who was Mr. Putin. So my point is that Vladimir Putin is definitely a bad person and the problem himself, of himself, but his potential exit from political arena will not solve the long-time security problem of Russia. And uh, our relationship with Russia uh, Last year, we published a book, 30 Years of Ukrainian Independence. And in a chapter devoted to Russia-Ukraine relations, there was there is a very good table, which is titled 30 Years of Russia-Ukraine Conflict. So we've been in a permanent conflict with Russia for 30 years, which ended with this bloody full-scale war. Um, Nevertheless, I agree that as long as the Putin's regime remains in power, uh, not just Vladimir Putin, but I stress his regime, Russia will present the main security threats to Ukraine and will remain a destabilizing factor for regional and as well as the global security. As was mentioned in the previous presentation, we don't know when and what is going to happen after Putin, but there will be an opportunity, I'm sure, and a great challenge for forming a post-war relationship with Russia. <clears throat> a peaceful coexistence is the maximum that Ukraine can realistically expect uh, in our relationship with Russia. And even this minimalistic expectation depends mostly on the terms on the outcomes of the war. Russia's military defeat in Ukraine and withdrawal of Russian troops behind the internationally recognized borders is probably uh, one of the best solutions. And anything less like freezing a front line at a certain stage of peace talks will postpone a next third stage of the war for uh, one to five years, according to the recent expert survey conducted by Razumko Center. Uh, currently, there are basically three scenarios uh, how this war can be ended. Uh, first is like freezing the front line 
uh, at the moment when the peace talks uh, take place. The second Russian withdrawal to the 20 February 23 line, or as I said, uh, the best option is if we force Russia to withdraw its troops behind the internationally recognized border. But even in this case, uh, I'm afraid that the period of relative peace will not last forever. What are the options for Ukraine uh, to provide the security guarantees? Uh, it's a, probably a combination of strong national defense capabilities plus external, reliable external security guarantees. Uh, very say, desirable is a NATO EU membership. Uh, by the way, I congratulate Finland with such a smart decision to join NATO, because in fact, Article 5, the main essence of the Article 5 is actually deterrence and defense. I think it's just probably not, not for sure from my understanding. So the Article 5 of NATO would be probably the best guarantee as a deterrence factor against any Russian aggression in the future. Uh, so what's going to happen after the Russian defeat, which is, I think, unavoidable and uh, it, it, it is, I think, very likely as it looks from the progress on the front line during the, the last days and previous months. Uh, so there might be another uh, attempt of democratization of Russia, uh, which is hardly likely, in my opinion, uh, to be to be more successful than the, the previous one. And Russia might follow the Soviet Union's path of disintegration. Uh, a scenario, by the way, we have limited, very limited power to impose and even more limited chances to prevent. But definitely uh, the Russia's military defeat will trigger a kind of tsunami development inside uh, Russia. So uh, we'll be facing another major crisis in Europe. But also I'm sure that pretty sure that this kind of scenario will provide us a long time solution. I also uh, read this interview uh, of Khodorkovsky is warning about the Russian administrative border becoming not just international border between different entities of Russia, but bloody borders for many years. Uh, but this is something, again, I repeat that uh, uh, Russia probably or Putin initiated this process. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And our task is to get prepared, to get some contingency planning to be ready to face the, this situation. Uh, to conclude my speech, again, I'd like to thank everyone for the invitation, for the support provided for Ukraine, and uh, regarding the, the question that I was asked to answer, what kind of uh, support Ukraine expects uh, for, from our partners, I think that this is, should be steady and uh, uh, like interest-based, value-based support for Ukraine as long as it is needed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oleksiy, for these uh, the remarks and analysis and insights uh, to the situation, as well as concerning uh, the future security needs of Ukraine uh, and the developments in Russia. And I have to say that Although the situation is very different, and you mentioned also the Finland's uh, NATO membership, of course, uh, the situation is very different. But there is, of course, uh, one uh, similar event, event uh, uh, similar feature of Ukraine and Finland that we both have a long border with Russia. And in our foreign policy, security policy thinking, whatever happens in Russia, the border will stay there. And there are ways in which uh, the country needs to cope with the changes and try to 
build stability and security for the region. So I think there is a is kind of a common understanding. It is easy to easy to find from your analysis as well. But now we will turn uh, one of our, our own. So we have Siniku Kasari, who is a leading researcher here at FIA. Uh, she is currently working in our new program, which is uh, titled Finnish Foreign Policy, Northern European Security and NATO. And Sinikuka, of course, has a very extensive track record in analyzing Russian foreign policy as well as EU-Russia relations. And she has been working recently quite a lot uh, uh, on different methods to provide foresight analysis as well uh, to the foreign policy discussions. Uh, I also have to say that uh, or note that she is one of the uh, one of the authors, I think, uh, of very first publications of this institute directly focusing on NATO. That was the report you and Christian Bursianen edited uh, or wrote uh, in, in 2002. <clears throat> and uh, it would be, of course, very interesting to hear your views concerning uh, the ongoing changes here in the northern European security environment. Of course, the Finnish and Swedish NATO membership has been also uh, mentioned. And perhaps you could also be willing to ponder um, how has Finland, potentially also Sweden, reckoned with an aggressive Russia uh, and how it sees the future prospects uh, for relations. Please, Siniku, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Juha. Uh, thank you, uh, Oleksiy and uh, and Heidi for great introductions. And of course, to all participants, uh, it's great to see so many of you today attending this event. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, I, Juha asked me to address in particular the Northern European security landscape and and how that has changed as a result uh, of the of Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine. And I would start uh, with the point that I think in Northern European security, Russia's war of aggression has has been a catalyst, not a disruptor as such. So it has been a catalyst that has accelerated dramatically developments that were in fact already taking shape at much slower pace and much more gradually. But nevertheless, I, I think that the direction had been set already earlier. Uh, so it's a catalyst. Um, both Finland and Sweden have been building their security partnerships with NATO very systematically uh, for many, many years already. And the idea has been to get as close to NATO as one can without being an actual member. So when the war broke out, this train of thought was uh, was interrupted, obviously, um, but nevertheless, the direction was already set. Um, so I think that even without this war, um, uh, both Finland and Sweden would have eventually, perhaps after a decade, applied for NATO membership. So in this respect, I think um, uh, Russia's war has simply accelerated development. And I think the same applies actually to, uh, to Ukraine's uh, European integration. Russia started this war in order to halt the development, the much longer trend that was already there and had been since the fall of the Soviet Union, basically. Um, uh, but in fact, what Russia ended up actually doing was to accelerate this development that now, uh, like Heidi pointed out already earlier, uh, both Ukraine and Moldova and so soon also Georgia will have the um, official candidate status. So uh, so it really didn't go as as uh, President Putin planned. Um, and one opinion, uh, one, I think, fact that proves that uh, the direction was already set was, of course, the public opinion in in Finland, for example, that 
the Finnish society very strongly uh, supported uh, Finland's application to NATO. And that was a, a big change. Um, but in order to understand uh, why they changed their uh, opinion so quickly after the war broke out, out was really the fact that the groundwork had been laid already before and just that this uh, invasion, this brutal war, just enabled very quick decisions uh, on this uh, this issue last spring. But I would say that another significant change in Northern Europe has been the fact that, and this is more like a mental shift, um, is that both Finland and Sweden uh, see more clearly that their national uh, defense is regional defense. And it's not only what NATO can do for us, but it's also what we can do for NATO. Uh, so there is a common realization in Northern Europe, but also I would say in Europe in general, that we are all in this together and we have to act together. We have to deter Russia uh, together and we have to defend Europe together. Um, so I think uh, this is a significant change uh, in the kind of strategic culture of Finland and, Na uh, and Sweden as well, that have long emphasized this kind of um, militarily non-alignment and try to somehow see in that they need to balance perhaps um, a kind of the regional balance. But now it is clear that uh, we are we are integrating fully to uh, into NATO structures. Uh, for the benefit of the whole Baltic Sea region and High North. And perhaps the third point that uh, I would like to point out uh, relating to the changes in Northern European security uh, is the fact that the Finnish and Swedish NATO memberships will strengthen NATO's collective defence considerably uh, in the Baltic Sea region, but also in the High North. And I think uh, what is interesting uh, this time around is the fact that often NATO's uh, enlargement rounds have been driven by political considerations and they haven't not they haven't really necessarily enhanced the collective defense as such. But this time I think it's quite different because uh, both Sweden and Finland um, have been politically stable. EU countries for very long period of time. Um, and this enlargement is driven by defense considerations, not so much political ones. Um, so, uh, so I think it's good for, for Finland and Sweden. It's good for the Baltic Sea region, but it's also good for NATO as well. Um, so, so that, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and uh, Juha, would, would you like me to address also the um, kind of the future related question on the uh, future prospects of EU Russia relations? Well, that would be nice if you if you're <laughs> willing to do that. We can, of course, have yeah. a discussion, but if you, yeah. if you have some points on that. Okay, yeah. so um, yeah, sure. Uh, just very briefly, since um, yeah. Uh, since Oleksiy and Heidi both uh, took up very bravely the very difficult question, so perhaps I should address that as well. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, for the time being, there's very little room for EU-Russia relations beyond the sustained and strengthened support for Ukraine and Ukraine's fight against Russian aggression, as well as, of course, the fact that we should be do everything we can to strengthen European defense and deterrence and also energy security. So this is where our kind of immediate focus should be. But looking beyond the war, um, I think the EU-Russia relations will, of course, depend on, on how the war will end and with what kind of Russia are we dealing with? I think this is something that Heidi already pointed out. 
But assuming that Putin will still be the leader of Russia after this war, I see very little prospects uh, for po positive or intensive cooperation. Uh, Putin uh, is responsible for the horrendous war crimes and and I think making deals with uh, such an actor would really bode very ill for wider European security order and its legitimacy. So I really don't uh, see that such cooperation would be very sustainable in the long term. So I think what we can say at this point is that there is no go going back to the EU relation, EU-Russia relationship uh, prior uh, to uh, 2022. And I think that uh, we should assume that EU and Russia will have much more distant uh, and restricted relationship uh, for a longer period of time until something changes more fundamentally in Russia. And perhaps I'm not quite that hopeful as, as Heidi uh, with re regard to this question, but we know that the um, future always uh, holds a great many surprises. So why not a positive one for change? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sinikuka, for bringing in the Northern European security perspective and these major changes. Uh, in the region which are of course uh, uh, historic in many ways but as you said that they have been going on already uh, uh, with the slower pace and of course one thing which is something that we are following very closely is that there's been uh, to some extent surprisingly little reaction from the Russian side uh, to the uh, changes uh, including Finland and Sweden's NATO uh, uh, membership this could be partly explained because of the uh, Russia is preoccupied with the uh, war of aggression in Ukraine. But, and, and of course, there are some expectations that in due course, uh, there will be uh, at least uh, uh, military uh, uh, developments uh, behind, uh, behind Russia's border to, to address this changed security landscape. But, but so far, rather few developments if we compare, for instance, the year 2014 and beyond when Russia became highly active in the Baltic Sea region. But now I think it's time to uh, move towards a discussion uh, uh, part of this event. And I would once again invite our uh, participants to post questions and comments to the chat box. I haven't seen any yet but I have, of course, prepared some of some themes uh, for for uh, discussion, and uh, I would perhaps want to start with the with the more sort of a um, current debate and discussion that we have had also with regard to the U.S. midterm elections, and and as a researcher and follow, follower of EU politics and, and European politics. Uh, there seems to be somehow uh, some kind of a nervousness, at least in the public domain, with regard to the continuing support uh, uh, for Ukraine. Uh, this is like news, news pieces related to certain member states or most recently the US midterm elections. They pop up, they make headlines. And as a researcher, I've been pondering every now and then that whether we see the full picture behind these uh, uh, kind of news flashes the kind of the steadfastness of the West and, and Europe in supporting Ukraine and also what comes with the decisions already made, uh, meaning the kind of the path dependency, which was also eluded here with the uh, Ukraine's uh, uh, EU uh, membership candidate status, for instance. So it would be interesting to hear your views because uh, you're following the discussion and the kind of the Western EU response uh, to the uh, war as well as supporting Ukraine from different different uh, uh, capitals, so to say. But what is your view on that? Whether this is something that we we should be worried, as some of the news uh, uh, headlines uh, suggest, or whether there is a kind of uh, prevailing sort of stronger uh, tendency to retain that that unity for supporting Ukraine. And of course, it would be very interesting to hear how. 
in Kiev, uh, Oleksiy sees this kind of a discussion and debate going on, going around every now and then. But maybe we could start with uh, with Heidi. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it has not gone unnoticed that uh, there have been uh, mass demonstrations in Italy last weekend about, um, well, I guess um, uh, it's a mix of uh, different things, but um, there is, an, uh, let's say, a strong undertone that uh, it's time to, to, to look at our internal problems again, poverty, energy prices, but I guess it's a mix of some, some flavor of different conspiracy theories. So. This is the kind of a new political reality that we have a force that is very quick to adopt new kinds of uh, narratives uh, which are not really supported by, by uh, reason, I would say. So perhaps this will um, uh, be strengthened in some member states, but I, I think um, uh, I would still be optimistic that we understand as a, as a let's say, like a large continent and our, our governments and parliaments and, um, and the European institutions, European Union institutions, that this is an existential situation where we are, that as Oleksii has pointed out, uh, this is our common, common battle. So I think, uh, let's say that uh, we have to make sure that these voices um, uh, are prevailing. Uh, and then uh, one of the concrete consequences, um, as uh, I think it was Sinikuka who used the word energy for the first time in this discussion, which is very essential. And but I, I must say I'm, of course I'm, I'm a green politician, so I see that uh, the silver lining of this uh, this catastrophe, <laughs> continental catastrophe, is that now um, there is this double transition away from um, Russian energy dependency, but also. Uh, away from fossil energy dependency, and we have to be very strong on that, because that's uh, that's then um, needed also. Because now that we live in a kind of a perma crisis situation, some people speak about poly crisis, so permanent poly, permanent and multifaceted uh, crisis that will uh, surprise us ever new dimensions. So uh, the, the energy issue is also existential and. Then, of course, how the EU member states deal with the energy poverty is really important. But um, I think it's essential that whatever the supporting mechanisms to our enterprises and citizens are, that they are also leading the way towards um, uh, independency of, of uh, fossil energy. So um, that's that would be my reaction to your question, Juma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi and Alexei. Um, do you want to come in and, and comment on the EU and Western unity? Uh, yes, this is one of the most critical questions that we or keeps us awake, let's say, in the middle of the night. And uh, we followed, of course, we followed closely the American elections. Uh, being, to be honest, pretty sure that no matter what, uh, how many seats or how the seats will be divided between two main, main parties in, in the United States, that the United States will continue support uh, for Ukraine because this is uh, the situation where our interests uh, in this war we can definitely say this is our common interest, and but uh, the situation again it it not it cannot last forever. I mean, we are another interest is is to uh, get out of this crisis as soon as possible and on the conditions that we uh, would satisfy us. Uh, but knocking the wood, I think uh, we are. Uh, pretty safe. Uh, also, if you look at the recent, uh, recently ad uh, adopted uh, NATO uh, and EU strategic documents, uh, it also provides us uh, uh, kind of big hope for uh, this political approaches or strategic approaches uh, 
which gives uh, ground for political decisions uh, and very favorable for Ukraine. But public opinion was mentioned a couple of times, and we do understand that people are getting tired of war, and uh, we shouldn't take for granted uh, this like, immense level of support that Ukraine enjoyed during the first months. So we have to uh, all have to work together uh, to explain people why it is important, and then that what they suffer is uh, something that is really needed for their own security, for their own future. And uh, you mentioned how the climate change issue. Uh, believe you or not, but when I saw this huge smoke and explosions in February this year, and one of the questions I asked myself, what about climate change and what about air pollution? <laughs> so this is, believe me, for us, I mean, it's still important, but it's just something secondary. And the, the damage that there are some estimates, like what kind of damage to all the efforts been done and all the investments been done during the international community to prevent prevent the global warming been just destroyed completely, at least on this part of European territory. Yes, I think that's a very important observation also in terms of the short time implications. And then, of course, when we hopefully soon move to the debates about the reconstruction of Ukraine, then, of course, uh, the kind of the midterm perspective, uh, I would believe that many of the activities done under the uh, reconstruction will be uh, climate friendly, uh, so to say. Uh, to 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 kind of a, and relates to the EU's and and Western aspirations to to move to carbon neutral societies, but now we have uh, Paul Smith who would like to come in also uh, uh, I guess from maybe a Austrian or from the editor's perspective for the book and then Zinni No, I, I'll be very quick. I have three to four points uh, which I would like to make uh, because I think the discussion is really really very interesting and I'd like to reiterate what uh, Alexi said on two issues. One is when you said at the end of your first intervention that uh, what kind of what kind of support for Ukraine would you expect? And you said it should be steady, it should be value-based, it should be interest-based, and it should be a continued support. I think uh, <clears throat> that is very crucial in terms of um, transatlantic relations and transatlantic support, but also within the European Union, um, at the beginning of your intervention, you said we have to keep explaining and continue explaining even uh, for those who cannot, sometimes cannot hear it anymore or have understood it. But um, I, I could not agree more because there's so much, um, we are running into the risk of having a, a fatigue on the Ukraine-Russian war in public opinion. Uh, with the public and and that's a risk we cannot take and that's why we have to keep explaining and continue explaining the motives and the reasons for our stance of support for Ukraine. I think that's very, very crucial and cannot be said enough. That's one point. Uh, the second point is, uh, Heidi, um, I'm a complete fan of, of the green transformation and, and I think the fight against climate change has to be on the forefront, but I'm wondering um, also in our countries whether uh, the question of tackling energy poverty, energy security is not uh, to some extent actually uh, pushing away the primary focus of fighting climate change. I, I wonder, I mean, um, realistically, Maybe it's it's a temporary development, and maybe as you have said, in the medium term it will be different. But if you look at 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 uh, at um, coal production, if you look at new nuclear power plants, if you look at the import of um, natural liquefied gas as as a substitute, I mean, um, how do you perceive that? Um, that was an issue. And um, and two last points, if I may. 
Cindy uh, Kuka mentioned, and I, from an Austrian perspective, that is of course very, very interesting, that um, for the public op opinion to adapt to this very quick uh, change um, or very quick decision on, on the NATO application of Finland and, and Sweden, the groundwork was already done way before. So there was actually a, 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 a long discussion on security issues and security challenges. Now there again, history, geography, um, all play a very, very uh, important role. But I think there are other countries where this discussion has not really taken place, no matter what the outcome could be. But we see that in Ireland, for example, and also in Austria, public opinion is quite the contrary to the developments which we've seen in public perception in Sweden and, um, and Finland. And my last point is, uh, because uh, Cindy Cook also mentioned um, the interesting effect of, of, of uh, a quick granting of candidate status uh, to Moldavia and uh, to Ukraine, and then Georgia being being in in in, in the pipeline. But um, I think what we have not um, what we need to focus on is a um, the broader enlargement and neighborhood strategy um, and also um, uh, what is your I mean the geopolitical dimension is everywhere and pushing these processes to advance really fast but what is our real strategy politically speaking for the Western Balkans as well bring them into the boat um, they have we have our processes a conditionality and requirements have to be met but there's this new, very strong political dimension, um, which also plays very much into the issue of narratives, disinformation, um, zones of influence versus uh, a value-based approach. I, I just wanted to stress that there also the, um, it goes beyond uh, potential members of the European Union. Um, it is an enlargement and a neighborhood strategy, but it also it is also about enlarging the European Union and what does it actually take to uh, to enlarge the European Union? I mean, there uh, we, it's easy to talk about it in terms of headlines, but the fact is there's at this point in time no unity, no agreement, no consensus on uh, enlargement and no consensus on reforming the European Union, which would actually be a condition for enlarging the European Union. And with that, I stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for these points and observations. And, and I think we can come back to those in the discussion. I'm sure that Heidi and Oleksiy would like to interview as well. But it's now Sinikou Kasari's turn. So please. Yeah, great. Thanks. I, I actually just wanted to address the question that you asked uh, about, you know, uh, about the kind of the Western support and how the conflict will end and so on. But I think um, here I would like to just to highlight the fact that uh, basically the way in which uh, the West or the US and European countries have reacted to uh, conflicts and wars in the post-Soviet space has traditionally been that you try to kind of see, get a ceasefire and somehow hold the situation on the ground and then try to negotiate an agreement. But I think now, you know, since we have been in this limbo since 2008 at least, um, and well, actually even earlier, but nevertheless, um, I think now we can see that Russia has really manipulated these peace processes uh, and they haven't really been about bringing peace, but it has been much more a tool for Russia uh, to change the conflict dynamic uh, to its own advantage. So if this is again our solution, that we start pressuring Ukraine to negotiate a kind of ceasefire um, uh, with Russia, I just don't really see... I don't really see this as a credible option at this point anymore. I mean, we have been there and now it's time to start thinking about something different. We don't really achieve sustainable peace uh, 
um, in this region by uh, engaging this kind of premature negotiations. It will just give Russia, you know, some five to ten years more time to prepare for the next round of of war. So um, I don't think that you know the Minsk agreement and the Normandy format is kind of uh, the formula that will bring uh, peace here. So uh, uh, so I think it's better to just support Ukraine. Um, and strengthen the support, uh, sustain the support, uh, and politically uh, also support Ukraine as much as we get we can. That's all. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Sinikuka as well. <clears throat> and now we have uh, uh, we have the polls points. I think that some of you might want to respond to those. Uh, uh, but there was also some questions from the audience. I think it's important to take those now on the table as well. Uh, at least two questions concern uh, the high north, what Sinikuka mentioned, that is the Arctic. <laughs> and there's also been this, uh, uh, this collaboration uh, within the Arctic Council, but also beyond that with Russia on issues like uh, 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 search and rescue facilities. Uh, as well as, of course, the climate change is a big topic uh, which kind of uh, is felt in the Arctic. And then, of course, now the question is that whether the collaboration, whether there are in the future also collaboration with Russia, whether that's possible or whether we see uh, the geopolitical uh, tensions and also the competition, even rivalry, spilling over to the, uh, to the Arctic uh, uh, region. But your views on, on the Arctic, whether the collaboration with Russia could continue or, or not, uh, would be very helpful if any of you want to touch upon that. And then there was a direct question also for Heidi uh, about the democracy in, in Russia. And, and also, as we have read many analyses and, and commentaries on the, on the bleak developments in Russia, some also going all the way to the history of Russia, having a rather deterministic, uh, perhaps, approach also that whether Russia could ever be in democracy. So I think uh, your views on that would be extremely helpful because we all know that you've been, uh, you have engaged with Russian civil society over over decades and, and, and perhaps you can bring into the table some interesting insights on that. And then I would also like to raise the question of enlargement uh, with all of you uh, 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 and, and the kind of the, <clears throat> the shift uh, or going back to the kind of the, the geopolitical elements of uh, enlargement. And, and, and I, I come from a generation when the enlargement was and has been viewed as one of the key foreign policy tools of the European Union. Uh, a rather successful one, of course. We have seen some some other type of developments also related to the uh, enlargement and and the, and the challenges that it has brought. Brought, but I think Paul's question whether and when EU is ready to enlarge in terms of its institutions and decision making is is an important one, as well as <clears throat> uh, at kind of will the expectations of enlargement uh, that has been now. Uh, uh, sort of opened up also for Western Balkans, uh, 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 whether whether those will materialize or whether there are possibilities that that EU can keep its promise, so to say. I think that's an that's a very important element of this uh, this new enlargement debate. What we are having, and so far we have just heard uh, that this is a longer term process and it takes time, but but there is very little sort of uh, practical steps. Uh, 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 and, and kind of a policies uh, directed to that direction, uh, 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 also knowing that the enlargement processes in Western Balkans have not been advancing as, as, as it's been promised for the Western Balkans. So who would like to go first? Uh, you can pick and choose from those questions, the ones that you would like to touch upon. Maybe Heidi, because there was a question that's on Arctic and the democracy in Russia. Maybe those are the ones that you feel uh, that you want to answer. Thanks, Juha. Um, I'd first like briefly to react to, to 
false um, observation of uh, the, let's say, uh, contradictory nature of the green transition, which now, of course, is a kind of an official mainstream EU policy. But um, it's true. But um, I have a colleague uh, who says that um, it's like um, at Christmas time, you overeat, you have all kinds of delicacies which you don't normally have in your diet. But if it's just temporary, it's okay. Then in January, you return to your diet your normal eating habits. I think this is a very nice way of putting it, that, that we, we probably need have, to have a need now to sort of uh, be a little bit more, uh, more uh, permissive on uh, deviating from, from the green transition. I mean, I, I of course would like to minimize the, the imports of LNG and the opening of coal mines and, and whatever, but um, if, if it is a temporary limited period, which will help us to get rid of uh, the uh, Russian energy dependency, then I would say we have to do it because I, I completely agree with Oleksiy that we can all be horrified about the, let's say, also the <laughs> environmental damage that the war is uh, is spreading. But it's uh, unfortunately now is the most important thing to defend Ukraine. So uh, on, uh, but but I I, I think Sunisinikukka made a very interesting um, observation, which is very much in line with what it, Oleksiy said earlier about the nature of these conflicts in the in the EU uh, neighborhood. That it's true that Russia has been very smart in manipulating the um, the, the any kind of uh, peace efforts, and um, and it's always the same pattern. And I I, I thank you, Sinikukka, very much for for saying that now. Those who call for ceasefire, uh, going to the negotiation table between Ukraine and Russia, are in a way going to end up in the same trap. And um, Oleksiy mentioned earlier that even if Russia would retreat to its uh, internationally recognized borders, to Ukraine's internationally recognized borders, they would perhaps not be a lasting peace. And this is, of course, a big challenge. How should European security be be shaped after this? Um, I tend to see that um, where we are going to go um, from the assumption that uh, there will be a defeat for Russia in this military uh, um, aggression. It will be like you know, like we talked about Germany in the year zero, like in 1945. I think it will be a similar situation for Russia. And there will be the, the, the deep question of accountability on war crimes and crimes against humanity. We cannot go to, to business as usual with, with a country that is in such a situation. So uh, that, I, I can't even think of what that could look like. So on democracy, um, I'm not saying that I'm optimistic, but um, I think there are some, uh, let's say, uh, weak flames that we have to keep alive. But with a view to, to uh, times ahead. So, um, I mean, whatever, uh, whatever will happen in reality, we have to believe that uh, there are those democratic forces somewhere in Russia and, and outside Russia now very much that we, we need to keep alive. So um, we don't know if this will succeed and lead into a democratic parliamentary democracy in Russia, which sounds like completely... Um, in, out of imagination today, but that's what we, uh, we, I believe we have to do. And I think it's great that, for instance, Hodorkovsky now said that um, um, it, without this kind of deep reform of, of the institutions and reduction of the powers of the president, even he, he doesn't think he will become president, but he said if he became president, uh, he would very soon, under the actual system, start to believe that he knows everything better than anybody else, and then he would concentrate all the powers to himself. So uh, this is the thing. There are no good chars. There are no bad chars. It's just simply undemocratic to have such a God-given um, sovereign power to, to one person. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi Hautala. And now I would like to give the floor for Oleksii Melnik. Maybe you want to touch upon some of the some of the themes and topics raised. Uh, uh, there was also one uh, question posed to you in the chat box, which relates to the uh, to the security currents, currencies that Ukraine uh, expects uh, post-war. I think the point was that this, if the war doesn't end in a kind of a, a complete defeat of Russia, 
so what uh, Ukraine could uh, uh, potentially uh, realistically uh, expect what kind of guarantees would be available and what what kind of guarantees you could, the Ukraine could strive for. Please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. This is one one of the topical issues that we are trying to uh, both discuss and uh, to promote. And uh, some of you probably aware of uh, the proposals made on the official level regarding the guarantees. The the best and the most desirable option, as I said, is uh, the NATO membership. Having in mind uh, the possibility of getting such a membership for Ukraine regarding all the circumstances. But as we saw from Finland and Sweden experience, uh, something that was impossible 12 months ago becomes possible. So nothing is impossible. And I assume that the situation can change to the extent that Ukraine will be accepted in the same fast track procedure. But again, a lot depends on, on the outcomes of the war. Uh, as for the other option, options, uh, uh, none of them probably can be a substitution because we have already experience uh, of having this big treaty with Russia on friendship, cooperation, and mutual something. And the uh, Budapest memorandum. memorandum uh, so there are, there are some other options, like uh, now I, I think being discussed in the experts' communities, like create, creating uh, coalitions of the willings. And we have some very practical examples, like Rammstein uh, formats. So that's a, this, some, this is something that I think we can uh, develop in the future and uh, not just to substitute uh, uh, existing institutions like NATO or the EU, but create insight or uh, as it is written in the EU strategic compass is uh, to encourage these coalitions of willing and able states to work and uh, conduct operations or other initiatives under the framework of the EU and, and the political guidance of the Council. And that, that's kind of options that we, we can discuss. Uh, but uh, again, it, it, it's still, uh, it's still not, not clear and a lot of depends what, what kind of Russia we will get, what kind of neighbor we will get uh, after the war. Ends. And uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that the best option for us uh, is uh, to have Russia not in the current size and the current shape. I don't know about this Khodorkovsky's idea of uh, having Russia as a parliamentary republic. I'm afraid this is not something that we can impose on Russia, and this is not something that is going to happen in Russia, so, but let's let's do what we can and, uh, and work together. It's, and uh, also, I, I see that the time is running. I uh, regarding the, the the question that was put at the beginning about Ukraine's support and the importance of this support. I think there are some basic principles that we have to observe when planning our uh, limited resources. First, there are all very urgent priorities and requests coming from Ukraine, like air defense, the anti-missile protection systems. And uh, this is something that I think that uh, we have to uh, try to satisfy, uh, keeping in mind all these strategic plans and uh, conditionality and so on and so forth. But at the same time, it's hard to keep this balance that uh, all that we do now uh, should be also aimed at the, our strategic uh, goals and uh, our future uh, security architecture. But this, uh, just, just this particular example for, for Ukrainian strengthening Ukrainian air defense, which serves at the same time uh, two purposes. 
First, it, it helps Ukraine now to protect the skies, protect civilian infrastructure, civilian population. But at the same time, this is a long time investment in our common uh, European uh, defense capabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. And now uh, back to Sinikuka, if you want to interview. Yes, intervene. thank you. I mean, there were several questions relating to this kind of positive cooperation, like, for example, search and rescue and uh, climate action and so on with Russia. Well, um, yes, it is true that uh, for a long time, although there were already massive tensions uh, in the Baltic Sea and also in, in, in the Arctic, uh, still, for example, we did have good collaboration on uh, search and rescue and so on. This kind of a bit more technical fields. Um, yes, uh, now they are on pause. But it's not because what we chose to do, it's because of what Russia chose to do in Ukraine. So I think sometimes you need to start a we need to start thinking as Europeans a bit more strategically also that sometimes you need to, you know, you, you don't just look at the trees, but you have to see the whole forest here. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, this also means that this kind of positive, like, for example, scientific cooperation uh, is, is not happening right now. It's because of Russia's decisions and also because Russian universities and scientific centers um, have actively supported the war. Uh, so this is, I think, this is something that we need to do. Unfortunately, this is the world as it is today. And even beyond the uh, war itself, I would see that the Unfortunately, the future for all of us will look gloomier uh, than what we are perha perhaps used to. Uh, I think that the future, uh, in future, we will see uh, overreaching geopolitical competition. We have uh, we see competing um, power centers with their own norms and agendas. Um, and even in economic terms, I think we will see also in future uh, more sh shortages. We have to pay a lot more for the goods that we are ordering. Um, and it's not all negative, I think. Uh, perhaps it's time that we start paying something for the energy and start paying something for the, you know, the bric-a-brac that we order from China. Uh, it's, you know, there are some positive elements into that, but it's a very different kind of world than this kind of globalized, open, transparent, benign world. Uh, so somehow I think uh, in future we need to start thinking about preparedness, um, a kind of um, supply chain, things like that much more seriously. So um so it's there is no going back uh, for EU-Russia relations, but not for wider kind of global global affairs. I would say. Thank you, thank you, Sinikukka. <clears throat> uh, there's been a lot of questions in the chat box, and I have posed uh, some some of you some of those to you already. There were the question about the the, the security guarantees that you. Ukraine could aspire. Then there's been two questions about the Arctic cooperation. That's something that we, we haven't been able to touch upon. Uh, uh, then there's been also questions about climate and energy. I think we have discussed uh, that quite a bit, but there's on one question from Arkari Moses, which is, I think, quite an uh, important one, and that's for Heidi Hautala. Uh, what, in your view, is the likelihood that using frozen Russian assets uh, will be done for the post-war reconstruction of Ukraine. I think this is at least something if, Heidi, you have a view from the European Parliament on that. So we have a couple of minutes left time, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, on, on security guarantees, by the way, I think it was um, a bit of a taboo outside Ukraine until this autumn 
to, to even to, to discuss again the possibility of, um, of one day um, um, Ukraine joining NATO. It's not a taboo anymore because Russia has crossed all the lines, all the lines that we, 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 can, we can imagine. So that, that will, uh, the discussion will there be to say what will be the impact is interesting to see. On the frozen Russian assets, um, Arkady, I think that um, the European Commission is um, uh, trying to um, understand uh, on what legal grounds that exactly could be done, that the frozen Russian assets could be used for, for reconstruction of Ukraine and, and other necessities. Um, uh, and I think, uh, for me, I, I would sort of place this discussion in this sort of, um, let's say, Russia in the year zero. <laughs> when we come to that. But, um, but certainly that is morally something that should be done. And they, they, I hope that there will be legal grounds to do that. But I'm not an expert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi Hautala. We are now approaching the end of this, uh, this webinar. And as you can see, the discussion also in the chat box have been uh, very lively. I think we have covered most of those uh, themes and topics which were raised there. I think there is maybe to end this webinar a very pertinent one post at least to two persons in the audience and that relates to the uh, international law as well as rules based order uh, in a way of uh, countries rights to defend themselves and then the problem emerging with uh, great powers or superpowers not uh, uh, signing up or living up with the rules we have established and the person asked that whether whether this is something that could change in the future. Uh, I think this is of course something that has been uh, noted with the Russia's war on aggression, also in the European perspective that what has actually happened is that the rules based security European security order has been fractured or even collapsed. And this has already been mentioned with the with the kind of a, 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 a the treaties and agreements agreed, uh, as well as the institutions, if we look at those like the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is now absent in in any of the in any meaningful way of the of the discussions and debates about the European security. So I think one of the big questions for the future, uh, which also this uh, uh, this webinar alludes to, is is that what is the kind of the future of rules based. Uh, uh, international order, uh, including also the, the future of the of the UN system and the interna international law enshrined there, as well as the regional uh, rules based organizations and institutions and their, uh, uh, their kind of uh, uh, meaning and importance in, in years to come. And I think this is, of course, something where we cannot provide any answers at the at the moment. But this is, of course, one of the questions which touch upon the, the broader topic of, of, of what kind of a security order uh, in Europe will emerge after the war, uh, Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine uh, has ended and the, and the peace has been restored. But with these words, I would now like to thank our audience for your active participation in this uh, webinar. And I would also like to uh, uh, give my uh, very big thank you for our excellent speakers uh, uh, in, this, in this webinar, Heidi Hautala, Oleksiy Melnik, uh, Siniku Kasari, as well as Paul Smith, uh, providing uh, some important comments as well as the opening words uh, in this webinar. And I would also like to thank uh, Jarmo Oikarinen and the European Parliament Helsinki Office for your co uh, cooperation for this event, as well as uh, uh, the welcoming words to this uh, event. This webinar is now adjourned. The, the discussion will undoubtedly continue in, uh, in, in FIA uh, uh, seminars and activities, including webinars uh, in your course. I wish you all a, a good Friday afternoon and weekend when we are there. Thank you very much. Thank you.